Thank you for inviting me to speak. So yes, I work in the Mayor's Culture Team. Um, and we believe essentially that, that culture and creativity are the essential ingredients to any successful city. And obviously, um, wonderful things happen by themselves, culturally speaking, but sometimes culture needs a helping hand. And so we're involved in everything from the Fourth Plinth in Trafalgar Square. We fund London Fashion Week um, and London Film Festival. And we do everything from fun music scholarships for young people through to providing apprenticeships in animation. And we frequently find ourselves in meetings with planners where we argue for the importance of culture in development. And a couple of years ago, our attention was brought to uh, this very building, um, and more specifically to the skate spot, which is practically beneath our feet. Some of you may remember the details. The South Bank Centre applied for planning permission to redevelop this entire site. It would cost around 120 million, and it would be paid for in part by demolishing the skate spot in the Undercroft and turning it into retail units and moving this um, uh, uh, some yards down the road to beneath Hungford Bridge. But I'd just like you to imagine this space, if you will, for a moment before the skaters came. Uh, the architects who built the Royal Festival Hall, as Ian will know, um, left the ground floor spaces empty. Um, and the spaces were never really used for anything. And over time, the Undercroft became a rather dark and unloved space, left empty except for the homeless people who came in and used it for shelter. And then in 1976, the skateboarders arrived. Uh, animating that space and bringing youth and movement and energy to the South Bank. And the graffiti artists arrived later, and they didn't always get on with the skateboarders. But between them, they gave an unloved space social and communal value. And by the time the South Bank Centre's planning application was referred to the mayor, there was already a public campaign to save the skate park. Thousands of people who lodged objections with Lambeth Council. And the skaters have claimed that this became the most unpopular planning application in British history. The mayor, after considering all sides of the argument, continued to support the South Bank Centre's development, but on the condition that the skaters stayed exactly where they were. But of course, this spot never belonged to the skaters. It's not their property, but by bringing this unloved space to life, they have given it social and communal value. And in doing so, the campaigners argue, the skaters have earned their right to stay there. Property, value, and ownership are also at the hearts of debates about graffiti and illegality. And they're also at the heart of three paintings that I'd like to show you this morning. Three very different paintings. But between them, the artworks raise interesting questions about property and about value and about how artists are understood and appreciated. And these are issues that are of interest to the mayor because they come up time and time again across a number of different forms of informal culture, whether it's skateboarding or whether it's graffiti or whether it's busking or whether it's pubs and clubs. So the first painting I'd like to look at is this one by Goya from the Disasters of War. And on the right is a desecration of that painting by Jake and Dinos Chapman. Many of you will remember the furora when the Chapmans bought a set of Goya's etchings and drew on them. The Chapman brothers replaced the faces of every one of Goya's figures with the heads of puppies and clowns, like the one in that picture. And there was widespread revulsion amongst many art critics, because isn't there something idolatrous about desecrating a work of art? Many dismissed it as an act of vandalism. Others were more ambivalent. After all, this is perfectly legal, because the Chapman brothers paid for the etchings. Goya's drawings were now their property, and the brothers were therefore free to do whatever they liked with them. So from the point of the, of the law, point of view of the law and the public authorities, no crime has been committed. 
No one called for the Chapman brothers to be arrested. No one believed they'd broken the law. The Chapman brothers might be vandals, but even their harshest critics conceded that it was the brothers' right to do whatever they wanted now with their own property. But doesn't this pair of paintings raise some interesting questions about the concepts of ownership and value and vandalism? Don't these values there seem more fluid than they first appear? Don't they depend on context? These values then are subjective. They mean different things to different people at different times. And even according to culture and tradition. For example, look at street artists and graffiti writers who paint and write over each other's work all the time to lesser or greater controversy. So before moving on to the second painting, I'd ask this. Are street artists vandals? Vandals of culture, vandals of property. And the key question, of course, is around value. And I don't just mean economic value. The value of an artist like Goya was well understood. Even in his own lifetime, Goya was a court painter to the Spanish monarch. But throughout history, the value of other artists has not always been appreciated. Like the artists behind this painting, Vision After the Sermon, Jacob Wrestling with the Angel. Why this work should be relevant to this discussion will hopefully become obvious. The clues are all there in the painting. First, look at the way Gauguin ignores the rules of perspective. So the figures in the foreground are too large. They almost block the action. And according to the traditions of the time, the wrestlers should be in the foreground, not in the background, but they're not. Next, look at the strong colors. This is in contrast to what had been the tradition since the Renaissance. No wonder the authorities rejected this painting by Gauguin when he offered it to them. But it's relevant because it raises important questions about value. And again, I'm not talking about economic value. The people, the authorities, did not value what Gauguin was doing. He was breaking away from what had gone before, in this case Impressionism, with its fascination with the everyday world. And he was pioneering a new style of painting that would become known as symbolism. And later on, he would go on to influence Picasso and Matisse. So, the alternative, I've asked whether street artists, graffiti writers are vandals, Another alternative, are they misunderstood pioneers like Gauguin? Are they making us rethink the canvas itself? Are they urging us to appreciate a new kind of visual art? I say new, but of course humans have been painting on walls all over the world since we lived in caves. And before we leave Gauguin, we should remember that he ended up turning his back on the West. He went travelling instead, incorporating the artistic traditions of Africa, Asia and French Polynesia. And so the last painting is not from Europe. It comes from South America. The artist is called Rodez. He's Colombian. He's 50 years old. And he's the father of two sons. And his two sons are street artists. They studied at the Université Nationale in Colombia. And as a family, they also traveled to Buenos Aires in nearby Argentina to paint and to teach. Rodez, their father, is a professor of art design at the university. And this painting comes from a wall in Bogota, which is often acknowledged as one of the world capitals of street art today. In 2011, the tragic death of a young and talented street artist by the police led to the city of Bogota taking a long and hard look at the way it dealt with graffiti. The authorities decided that it was time to take a less confrontational approach between the authorities and graffiti writers and artists. And the mayor of Bogota issued a decree promoting the practice of graffiti in the city as a form of artistic expression. And at the same time, the decree defined surfaces that were off limits, for example, monuments and public buildings. Graffiti in Bogota has been declassified from a crime to a violation of the police code. And this is a quote from, oh, I've just, have I knelt on it? No, it's gone. There we go. This is a quote from Gildardo Pico, sub-commanding officer in the Bogotá police. And forgive me, it's from 2010, but I think it still stands. When a person is found drawing graffiti, the police are forbidden to detain the artist. Nevertheless, authorities are authorised to force the artist to erase his work, leave the site as it was before the art, and pay for the damage done to the property the owner if a police report is filed. 
And so I'd like to ask whether such a thing could happen here. And personally, I am ambivalent about the thought of public authorities getting involved in street art and graffiti. It raises for me a lot of questions. Number one, does being told where you can paint go against the spirit of graffiti? The public authorities in Bogota have sat down with the graffiti writers and had meetings with them. The city authorities have agreed not to remove street art as long as it's performed in a responsible way. But what are the implications of street art becoming respectable? In Bogota, the police have commissioned street artists to paint police posts. The Bogota Secretary of Culture says that graffiti is one of the most developed cultural and artistic manifestations of the new century, so should not be seen as a crime or disorder. But can street art retain its authenticity in the face of such public respectability? The Bogota approach aims to strike a balance between the rights of property owners on the one hand and support for artistic and freedom of expression on the other. If this approach were to be adopted in London or in the UK more widely, who might the winners be and who might lose out? What might the unforeseen consequences be? Do we want to see street art embraced by advertisers and corporations and developers? Do we want to see a growing division between graffiti writing outlaws on the one hand and the respectable street muralists on the other? Or are these things happening anyway? In Bogota, it's claimed that artists now have time to practice and perfect their technique. They don't have to spray and run away. Others argue that the declassification has led to an explosion in tagging that has no artistic merit whatsoever. So, again, I ask myself, could the Bogota approach ever work in London? And I come to this event today with far more questions than answers. And I'd like to thank Lorraine and Sabine and the team and UCL and St. Martin's for providing such a fantastic opportunity to debate a fascinating subject. And so I end by asking, are graffiti writers and, askers and artists vandals? Are they modern day pioneers like Gauguin? Or, like the artist Rodez and his sons, are they somewhere in between? Thank you. This is a probably difficult question for you, but I, I realised recently you've made some changes about busking, and I wonder if you could talk about that and consider how it might relate to this subject. Yeah, sure. So we've been working on this for some time. Um, so it was before the trigger that I'm just going to mention. But the trigger was, most recently, we've been, we've been holding a gigs competition, we call it. And it's a um, public competition for... Um, young musicians. We hold it every summer and you enter, you, you audition. If you're good enough, you get chosen and then you get public busking pitches all over London. So outside St. Paul's and the tube stations and so on. And um, the public vote for you and there's a winner. And I think it was July. The winners of our busking competition, the, the, the best of the best, were arrested in Leicester Square for busking. It made the press. And we were, as I say, already working on this anyway, but, but it kind of it galvanized things and brought people together more quickly. And so we've kind of created a busking task force. Isn't everything a task force these days? But the task force brings together local authorities and, and police and others. And the point of it is to try and prevent buskers from being, um, being, being carted away in police vans. But equally, what we want to do also is drive up quality um, so there is a bit of a quid pro quo. It's not just um, everything buskers do is fantastic um, without any kind of quality control attached to it. By hopefully, by kind of bringing busking into the fold, as it were, and, and making buskers less of, a, of outlaws, it also allows us then, I'm repeating myself now, um, but to give us some quality control. So I do think potentially there is a read across. As I say, I, I'm still ambivalent. I'm yet to be fully persuaded about graffiti and street art and whether we should be involved. Um, my big concern is always the, the kind of the dead hand of the, the public sector. And the last thing I'd want is, is headlines with, and pictures of you know, Boris with a spray can. I don't think that would, would, would help uh, either us or, or, or graffiti writers or artists or anyone else. 
But yes, I do think that the, the, the busking model and the work we're doing on that could potentially be read across into other, into other art forms and sectors. Hi, thank you for that. So my question relating to that is, why should busking be about quality? I don't understand why that's important. And in the same way, in that manner, I feel that the skate park is like the kind of the permissible subversion, like par excellence of the creative city. Does that not just add a gloss to the fact that um, the housing crisis, gentrification, what, all these issues, which are obviously intrinsically related to graffiti mm. and street art, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of rambling and not already asking a question, but let's go back to the first one. Why is it about quality? Why should busking or street art or graffiti be about this idea of quality, in inverted commas? Yeah, no, it's a good point. It's a good point. And when I say quality, I mean, it's not, it's not that to get a busking pitch in London, you have to have played for the London Symphony Orchestra. I don't mean that, but it's, it's basic kind of rules. For example, don't turn up to a busking pitch and pay, play one song over and over and over again, which just irritates the hell out of anyone living in that area. But I do take your point that, and this is, this is my concern actually about graffiti and street art, is that do we, as soon as we get involved, as soon as we start putting into you know, codes of practice and regulations and everything else, do we start to chip away at the authenticity of the experience, the authenticity of the artist, the authenticity of, of if we were to read across graffiti writers and street artists. So, I actually, yeah, I completely share the same concern. And that, that's, that's at the heart of my kind of ambivalence towards public authorities kind of wading in um, into this area. With the case of the skate park, for example, we had to. It was a planning application and it was referable to the mayor. Um, we didn't go kind of looking for things to kind of meddle in. Um, with busking, as I say, it was a quid pro quo. Um, in, in, in kind of striking a deal, if you like, between legitimising busking or, or, or trying to reduce, you know, busking being um, um, arrested and so on, we had to kind of tackle the, the concerns that were raised, which were it annoys the hell out of residents when a busker turns up and plays one song over and over and over again. So, you know, could we do something about that and try and strike a balance? But I am concerned about, you know, whether if, if we were to wade in on graffiti and street art. Yeah, I had a question about the process in London. Do you have community meetings? For example, the busker or the street art, do you, because I perfectly understand, the community has to look at the art or hear the music. So is there a process that you have established for involving community and allowing, disallowing roles and things like that? It depends on, I mean, in London, we in City Hall, we can't dictate what each of the local authorities in the 33 boroughs do. Um, so what we tend to do and is just simply bring together as many voices as we can. And that, that's, the, that's the purpose of this, this kind of grandiose sounding busking task force, because we can't say to any, any local authority, you must do this, you must do that. Um, and I don't think we, it just wouldn't work. We wouldn't want to do that. Um, but yeah, I mean, giving the, the community a voice, but you know, even that is difficult because it's whose voice, who's shouting the loudest, how do you get consensus? So yeah, I think, I think in, in anything like this, in any kind of policy, we try and make sure we speak to as many people as possible from as many different communities. Because what you want to do is to cut through that because it is often the people who shout the loudest are, are heard the most. I mean, that's just a truism. But yeah, we do try and go out to as many as possible. In relation to the different things that's been said with the first bit, um, with regards to nationalism and um, the comment you made about uh, South Bank and protecting a space for freedom of reappropriating it creatively, and also thinking about the uh, Jeremy Rilfkin, who's a writer and talks about the commercialization of culture, do you think that? It's, re it's more about being given, and in relation also to the comment over there about glossing and things having to be a certain quality. Don't you think it's more about being able to give the freedom of space to it, have expression of creativity? Yeah, completely agree. And I think that if we in City Hall were to be involved in some way, then hopefully 
that's what it would be. It would be a permission. It wouldn't be, we wouldn't become the Lord Chamberlain um, and assess quality control. In the, in the case of busking, it is about just setting certain kind of rules and basic standards, basically, um, which are hopefully rules of good behavior. But again, my, my concern with graffiti and so on is, do we want to see that kind of, well, level of permission, level of write-off, level of sign-off, um, and can we, when ultimately um, people also have to have a right to their own property? As I say, I, I don't come here with any answers on that yet. I'm, ho I'm hoping to get a, a better feel for that after these sessions. Yeah, hello. Um, on the question of quality, um, I was really glad to see that you started your slideshow with a, um, the Undercroft as a member of the Long Live South Bank campaign. We didn't campaign uh, to save the space for professional skaters. We say campaign to save the space for all abilities. Um, and I think you can translate that to uh, busking and to graffiti. I mean, I think we get into areas of uh, tension mm. when the state decides um, what is art and what isn't art in the context of what's on a wall and on the street. And uh, I, I think that's, you know, uh, something that probably we could get in, involved with a bit later on in the sessions. Yeah, as I say, I agree. Uh, otherwise, you're seeing the return of the Lord Chamberlain, but for other art forms or more informal art forms. I think the question, I think I, I might have misled by talking about quality. What I, what I think I mean is more kind of standards of behavior. But even that, I think, starts to raise, you know, ring alarm bells, because you're then becoming not so much the Lord Chamberlain, but nanny. Um, so that's why I remain ambivalent. Um, I think we could create as many problems as we would solve. Um, that's well, not a definitive answer, I'm afraid, sorry, but that, that, that's my point, I think. Just following on from Mark and other people's um, uh, comments about um, uh, uh, quality. I think one of the things, one of the words you used that I thought was quite interesting is the question of authenticity and how you deal with that. I think one of the things that's really interesting about the Undercroft and one of the things that's very interesting about uh, other kind of street level activities and the way in which they uh, are activated is, as you say, is the degree to which there's a kind of institutional involvement in that. So to use the Undercroft it, it, uh, as an example, you know, the, the street art there only started in 2005, I think, when the, when the side effects of urethane and badger put the blocks in, and then it's a permission spot. Mm. It's not a, you know, it is a legitimised permission spot, as indeed is the skateboarding in many ways there, because it was, you know, it's a space designed by architects to be used in uncertain ways. And lots of the elements there have been de purposely designed for skateboarding. And yet, obviously, it has this other kind of history all over it. So for some people, it's a, it's a hugely authentic street-level space. For other people, it sort of verges on public performance because you've got a very big mm. kind of public who go and watch and stand behind the barrier and, you know, even occasionally clap when they see things. You know, it's a very kind of curious space. But I think what this shows is that there's a range of different, in the comment about public spaces, about really the fact that what you need to do is provide public spaces, is that they can have different levels of authenticity, which verge from, which, and what that authenticity is, depends, I think, particularly on the mindset of the people who are engaging within it and what kind of authenticity they want to have. Mm. Um, so I don't think, I, I suppose it's just a comment really that, that, that I don't think there's any single solution, obviously, to what authenticity is or about standards, that it, it will mean different things to different yeah. people. And actually that's something I'm quite interested in hearing more about over the next uh, three days as well. Yeah. No, I completely agree because, again, there are different options in terms of how public authorities can be involved. So, for example, we could... Comp retain the status quo in terms of legal framework, criminal damage legislation, everything else. But we could, somehow, we'd have to find them first, but double or treble the numbers of legal walls or spaces in London. But again, I, does that affect authenticity? Is, is that the right solution? Um, yeah. Again, I don't have any answers at this stage.
Thanks, Adam. Let's, Cheers, let's draw a line there.